In the winter of 1781, the American and British forces were embroiled in a bitter stalemate. The British occupied the major cities of New York, Savannah, Charleston, and Wilmington, but are essentially trapped behind their walls. Meanwhile, the Americans control vast swaths of the countryside in the American Northeast and South. The main American force, under the command of George Washington, is unwilling to depart from the safety of their fortress at West Point, located in the lower Hudson Valley. Washington fears that if his army deports this fortress, the British will have free reign to reinforce the Southern Theater from their position in New York City. Similarly, the main British army, under the command of General Clinton, is unwilling to depart their garrison in New York. Clinton fears that if his army departs, the Americans will launch an attack on New York and seize the city, though he has no real evidence to support this fear. The Americans in the South, under the command of General Greene and General Lafayette, have full control over the countryside, but are unable to dislodge the British from their fortified positions in the key cities of Savannah and Charleston. And up until now, the British Navy has had free reign to dominate the seas in this war, but soon the arrival of a powerful French fleet in the West Indies will tip the scales of balance. Only in Virginia is either side showing any true initiative. General Cornwallis has brought his southern army into Virginia in the hopes that he can land a decisive victory and end the war. He was encouraged by the success of General Bandict Arnold, who ran notably brutal raids on the city of Richmond and on the rest of the Virginia countryside. Virginia has been a main loading ground for the American militiamen who were flooding south and fueling the resistance. Further, Virginia acted as a main hub for American tobacco commerce, which was largely floating the American economy at this time, and the production of salt, which was necessary to preserve the American rations. Despite his initiative, Virginia has proven to be as indecisive as any other theater that the British have since engaged on. The American troops under Lafayette refused to face Cornwallis in battle, and instead launched incessant skirmish attacks and raids at the British positions. Without the ability to take full control of Virginia and to lock the Americans into a single decisive bat battle, Cornwallis soon saw that his campaign therein was fruitless. Cornwallis moved his men to Yorktown, hoping to soon move his men back to the south and resume his southern campaign. But he was bound by orders coming from Clinton in New York. Clinton, ever indecisive, continuously gave Cornwallis conflicting orders, which prevented Cornwallis from resuming his initiative. While in the South Carolinas, Cornwallis had been able to earn victories while disobeying Clinton, he was now too close to Clinton's command post to blatantly disobey orders. In May of 1781, Clinton ordered Cornwallis to move to Chesapeake Bay and construct a naval post at Yorktown. He was additionally ordered to send 2,000 troops back to New York to prepare for Clinton's self-imagined siege. Cornwallis, suspecting that Clinton was merely hoping to handicap him due to jealousy, refused to send the 2,000 men but he obliged in moving to Yorktown and preparing a naval port. Cornwallis' suspicion may not have been misplaced, as Clinton already fielded 12,000 men in New York, which was more than double what Washington commanded. Clinton had not engaged in any major offensive movements in ne nearly two years, and he was in danger of being overshadowed by Cornwallis' success. Meanwhile, General Lafayette and his militiamen moved toward Cornwallis' position. They saw him in Yorktown and realized the potential to trap an entire British army and defeat them therein. He quickly sent word to the French and the Americans, informing them of the potential for a great victory. Meanwhile, in New York, Washington anxiously awaited the arrival of 5,500 French troops who were marching from their position in Rhode Island under the command of General Rochambeau. The commanders of the two armies met, and Washington proposed his plan to lay siege to the British in New York. The French attempted to dissuade Washington as the proposed plan seemed suicidal given the British's overwhelming numerical superiority in the years they'd had to fortify the city. Soon, word came that French Admiral de Grasse had departed the West Indies with a force of 28 warships and 3,300 men. De Grasse had promised to return to the West Indies by November in order to assist the Spanish war effort, and so the time to act with this fleet was fleeting. Upon learning this news, Washington insisted that the time to attack New York had come. He had become almost obsessed with the idea of ousting the British from their position in Manhattan, and believed that ousting them from New York was the only way to secure victory in the war. However, much to Washington's credit, as he had done in Boston, he was now willing to listen to the opinions of the lesser officers and the French generals, and thus he soon finally came to realize the potential that could be achieved with a decisive victory at Yorktown. 
Time was critical, as the French had thus far been a fairly unreliable ally, unwilling to risk the lives of their men unless victory was certain. The French Admiral would surely return to the West Indies by October, and thus Washington only had limited time to set a strap. On August 14, 1781, Washington led his army out of West Point in the hopes to engage his army in the first offensive in nearly three years. The joint armies moved with all haste towards Yorktown. The march Washington was about to embark on is considered one of the greatest feats of military history due to the speed in which it was conducted and the difficulties presented by coordinating the movements of two armies who spoke different languages during the grueling August heat, especially considering that Washington's army contained thousands of untrained militiamen. Washington would take a gamble, leaving only 3,500 men behind in West Point to defend the American rear. If Quinton decided to launch an offensive, he would surely be able to capture West Point, and with it, all of New England was likely to be lost. But Washington, knowing Clinton's passive temperament, bet that Clinton would remain idly in New York City. Not wishing to leave such an important thing to chance, Washington then marched his army to Staten Island, where he had them rapidly construct fortifications and even construct a French bakery. All the while, he spread false letters containing news that an attack on New York was about to commence. Clinton would take the bait hook, line, and sinker, and remain idly in New York, awaiting an attack, which would never come. With the deception laid, the joint army rapidly marched through the grueling summer heat towards Virginia. The disjointed and ununified armies would complete their march on September 14, 1781, only just over a month after their departure. The speed and efficiency in which this march was completed is what lends it to the historical annals. Such a march could easily have taken several months, but the joint force was able to achieve it in just over 30 days. Unsurprisingly, the American army and the French reinforcements caught Cornwallis off guard. The general, who had spent much of his career on the offensive, was now trapped in the small town of Yorktown. At this moment, one thing was clear to Cornwallis. If he did not receive aid soon, his entire army would risk being lost. This is Grim Battaglia and you're watching my documentary on the American Revolution and the Siege of Charleston. On September 1st, shortly before the arrival of Washington and his men, the French fleet under de Grasse arrived in Chesapeake Bay. In order to prevent Cornwallis from escaping Yorktown, it was necessary for de Grasse to move his fleet into the bay and prevent a river crossing. However, afraid of having his fleet cornered by the British, de Grasse declined to do so. While this could have proven costly, fortunately for the Americans, Cornwallis decided to remain within Yorktown confident that the stronger British fleet would achieve victory. Meanwhile, the British fleet had moved to New York to defend against Washington's pretend attack, but upon realizing the ruse, the fleet moved back to Yorktown and reached Chesapeake Bay on September 5, 1781. The British fleet, under the command of Admiral Graves, arrived and prepared to give battle to the French. Like de Grasse, Admiral Graves was afraid to move his fleet into the mouth of the bay. The two sides would engage each other soon and the fate of the war would be at stake. The British fleet arrived sooner than de Grasse had been expecting. Upon their arrival, the French fleet was still offloading officers, sailors, and soldiers onto the land. The French entered a state of panic and swiftly boarded their ships as soon as possible. This caused many of the French ships to enter the battle undermanned and in disorder. However, the British Admiral would fail to take advantage of this error. In the tactics of the day, the ships would set up in a line and as they sailed across from each other, they would fire directly into each other. However, the two fleets would be approaching this battle at an angle, causing confusion amongst both admirals. The battle would last only two hours. Throughout, there was much confusion on the British side, as Admiral Graves failed to form his men into a proper battle line, giving conflicting flag signals to the ships in the rear. This would consequently cause nearly a fourth of the British fleet to be unengaged throughout the battle, as they were too far away to engage in a proper battle formation. The battle would end in what was essentially a draw. Both fleets had five ships damaged, while the British had one ship sunk, scuttled by their own men. But reports say that this one ship was damaged almost beyond repair before the battle had even commenced. In regards to casualties, both sides suffered approximately 250 losses. Despite this, the British Admiral Graves tended to act like his fleet had been defeated. He pulled back, allowing the French to occupy the fortified bay, which Admiral de Grasse had now seen the benefit 
of using as a defensive position. For two days, the fleets sat idly across from each other. Any British attempt to enter the bay would be met from a, by bombardment from all sides by the French in their new fortified position. However, the fate of the entire British army was on the line, and it was clear that the British fleet would have to act in order to save them. Despite this, on September 9th, when the French fleet moved out to engage the British, Graves gave the order for his fleet to retreat back to New York. Upon their arrival in the harbor of New York, they were met with shock and dismay by the loyalists living in the city. Seeing the British fleet in retreat, Cornwallis knew that an assault would soon be underway. He sent out his men to clear the trees around the city in order to clear a line of fire. Then he built earthworks around the town and constructed six fortified redoubts on the outskirts in order to prepare for an assault. He also removed all the cannons from his ships and moved them to the walls to fortify the defenses. All the while, the French and the Americans continued to ferry men across the river and began to move into their position, blockading and trapping Cornwallis in the town of Yorktown. The French would take up position on the left, while the Americans would take the spot of honor on the right. The artillery used by the French and the Americans was vastly superior to that used by Cornwallis. The French artillery had been brought from Newport, and it was designed for a siege just as was about to commence. Finally, the Americans and French sent a small contingent over to Worcester Enclave in order to prevent a British breakout attempt therefrom. Washington observed the scenario. He saw that they had vastly superior numbers, with 8,000, 18,000 combined strength and a massive fleet at his disposal. Cornwallis, on the other hand, commanded only 8,000 men. Despite this, Cornwallis had done much work fortifying his position. The walls around the city were strong and the redoubts would be difficult to take. Washington knew that an assault was unlikely to prevail, and so the Americans and French prepared for what would be one of the last great sieges of the era. By September 24th, the Allied forces were in position. They needed to achieve victory quickly, since the French fleet would return back to the West Indies by October 15th, only a mere two weeks away. The bombardment soon began. The Allied cannons had range over the city, destroying its earthworks, sinking docked British ships, and exposing the British position. Cornwallis, who is known for his daring and initiative, could have led his men on his rowboats and the remaining ships to an escape if he took his men and went to Charleston's enclave across the river. The French fleet was positioned too far to the east to prevent this. The French fleet was wary of moving down river and being trapped if the British fleet re-emerged. Cornwallis, Cornwallis had seen the naval battle and he knew that the British fleet was not defeated. He believed they would soon return, either bringing reinforcements or allowing for Cornwallis to make a safe escape. On September 26th, this belief was reinforced when he received a correspondence from Quinton in New York. Clinton informed Cornwallis that the British retreat had only been tactical in nature, and that the fleet was regrouping and preparing to move back to the Chesapeake Bay, and they would bring with them 7,000 reinforcements. Hearing this, Cornwallis, seeing the futility of his outer defenses and confident that the reinforcements would soon arrive, ordered his men to abandon the outer redoubts and focus all defense on the inner city. The Americans witnessed this on September 28th. They were surprised to see the British withdraw so soon, but they took advantage of the situation. Both the Americans and French moved their men and cannons forward, seizing the outer redoubts. Much to their surprise, the British fired almost no shots while the Americans marched in parade formation and slowly positioned themselves in their new redoubts. Cornwallis likely chose not to retreat because he knew that a great opportunity for the British Army had presented itself. Clinton commanded 12,000 men in New York. He could lead his men down towards Yorktown, and the two armies could combine. Together, Cornwallis and Clinton's men would outnumber the Franco-American Allied troops. They could launch a massive pincer attack on them, catching them completely off guard and potentially destroying the main American army in one decisive battle. Such a victory could lead to the end of the war. Alternatively, Clinton could march his men north. He knew that Washington's men were not guarding West Point since they were clearly surrounding Cornwallis. If Clinton was able to take West Point, he'd be able to achieve what Johnny Burgoyne had failed to do in the Battle of Saratoga. 
he could capture all of New England and bring it back into the British domain, effectively cutting the American colonies in two. However, this was not to be. By October 5th, the date which Clinton had said he would arrive in Yorktown with reinforcements, Clinton had still not even departed New York. Between September 28th and October 4th, the Americans and French rained hell upon the British position. The American and French artillery was clearly superior to the British in both number, ordnance, and range. The British position was largely exposed, and within the city, the situation was no better. Fever, dysentery, and other diseases ran rampant throughout Yorktown. Meanwhile, supplies began to dwindle due to the blockade by the French fleet and the Franco-American forces. Despite this success, Washington knew that the siege was not progressing fast enough. By October 4th, he was only a week away from the departure of the French fleet, and victory would have to be achieved quickly, or else all the campaign would have been for naught. On the night of October 4th, a loud storm set in, and this allowed Washington to proceed to the next part of his plan to accelerate the siege. He had his men build a small encampment to the southeast of his position, which was littered with campfires in order to draw British attention. The British took the bait and began launching a relentless artillery barrage on the American diversionary camp. The noise of the artillery barrage and the storm allowed the American and French troops to move 4,300 men forward. Once there, Washington took up a pickaxe and personally broke ground, beginning the next phase of the siege. The troops would build a fortified entrenchment a mere 400 yards from the British position. This was out of range of much of the British artillery, but well within range of much of the Franco-American artillery. The American and French troops impressively completed this project in only one night and on October 5th, the British were shocked to see the new trenches surrounding their position. By October 9th, the American and French had brought forward more artillery and moved it into the trenches to prepare to lay a relentless siege to Cornwallis's men. With the American artillery in position, the barrage commenced that night, and that night alone, over a thousand shells would land on Yorktown. The British, seeing their position was so exposed, gave the command that no more artillery could be fired at night, lest the muzzle flare and ember from their cannons give away their position. An American, witnessing the event, described the following. While well, all around was thunder and lightning from our numerous cannons and mortars, and in the darkness of the night, presented one of the most sublime and magnificent spectacles which can be imagined. Some of our shells, overreaching the town, were seen to fall into the river, and bursting, throwing up columns of water, like the spouting of monsters, into the deep. On October 10th, the Franco-Americans launched an attack on Charleston's enclave. Although they were driven back, they dealt the British therein many casualties, and the hated Charleston was personally injured. Though he escaped, he would never fight in another battle in the American Revolution. By the 11th, the British reinforcements were now six days overdue, but Cornwallis had not given up hope and continued to defend his position. He moved his cannons to the outer redoubts and refortified the southeast corner of the river. Then, a desperate British counteroffensive began. They relentlessly fired their cannons at the Americans and French, who were a mere 300 yards from the British position. The red-hot shot being lobbed through the night created an almost surreal image. Nonetheless, the American and French bravely stood their ground, displaying considerable courage while operating directly under the British cannons and well within their range. By October 14th, the Americans had convinced the French fleet to stay just one week longer in order to see out the siege. The Americans and French launched a daring night raid on the two British redoubts, the capturing of which was necessary to complete their second trench line. They advanced under the cover of a barrage of artillery fire, smoke, and dirt. A vicious hand-to-hand -hand battle came underway, where the defense of the British could only be described as heroic. The French would suffer over a hundred casualties while trying to wrest control from the British. Similarly, a less deadly battle came underway at the Second Redoubt, which was taken by the Americans under the control of Alexander Hamilton. As the bitter engagement was underway, Washington watched from only a short distance away. As the cannons exploded, some of the dirt and debris fell upon his hat, and one of his men implored him to move back, to which Washington, knowing the importance of taking their doubts, calmly replied, 
if you are afraid, you have the liberty to step back. The Americans and French were able to successfully oust the British from their doubts and turn the cannons upon their position. Thereafter, the American men hastily moved forward and constructed a new line of trenches a mere 300 yards away from the British position. The bombardment now took devastating form, tearing directly through the British's hastily built defenses. Cornwallis was driven back from the governor's house and forced to take shelter in a kind of cave by the riverside. His relief force was now more than a week overdue. He would write, My situation becomes very critical. We dared not show a gun. The safety of the place is therefore so precarious that I cannot recommend that the fleet and the army should run great risk in endeavoring to save us. However, his advice was fruitless because at this point, Clinton had still not even departed from New York. Later on October 15th, the British launched a counterattack at the newly seized redoubts. They were able to drive the French and the Americans from their position, but under intense fire from the Americans' first parallel, they were merely able to spike the guns before retreating, rather than using liquid metal to permanently disable them. On October 16th, with the relief force now two weeks overdue, Cornwallis at last attempted an escape. He loaded his men into the rowboats that still remained after the siege and attempted to cross the river to Tarleton's enclave. While some men would make it, a storm would blow in, driving many of the rowboats off course. Cornwallis, seeing the futility of it all, directed all his men to row back and to regroup at Yorktown. He didn't want to needlessly risk the lives of his own men in a breakout attempt that was likely to fail. By October 18th, on the anniversary of the defeat at Saratoga, Cornwallis took stock of his position. His men were exhausted, not being able to sleep due to the constant artillery barrages. They were hungry from the blockade cutting off supplies. Fever and disease had run through their ranks, and many had suffered casualties in the battles which had just gone underway. Cornwallis at last realized that the game was up. He raised the, right flag, the white flag, and surrender talks commenced. The British were directed to surrender to the marching tune of a British song, for fear that they would mockingly attempt to play a British tune as had happened many times before. On October 19th, when the British filed out it is said that the tune they chose was the world turned upside down. Cornwallis, however, snubbed Washington, claiming to be ill. Instead, he sent his second-in-command, Brigadier Charles O'Hara, who pointedly presented his sword to General Rochambeau at Washington's side. A gesture signifying that the British had been defeated by the French and not by the Americans. Rochambeau pointed to the American commander in a cold and controlled fury. Washington passed Cornwallis's subordinate, on to General Lincoln, the American general defeated at the Siege of Charleston, who then ordered O'Hara and his men down a gauntlet of French troops on the left and American troops on the right. There, the British were forced to throw down their arms, and it is reported that many of them did so with a look of anger, bitterness, and humiliation. Though the defeat of an entire British army in American hands was clearly significant, there was no reason that this had to be the end of the war. Clinton controlled 12,000 men in New York, and the British still controlled powerful garrisons throughout the South, which the Americans could not oust. After the victory, Washington would write to Congress, telling them not to get complacent and that the war could still be far from over. However, in Britain, the Minister of War, Lord North, took the news like a bullet to the breast, exclaiming that it is all over. King George, however, showed greater proportion. He stated, I have no doubt that when the men are little recovered of the shock felt by the bad news, they will find the necessity of carrying on the war, though the mode of it may require alterations. Clearly, it would turn out that Lord North would be correct, as Yorktown was the last major battle ever fought in the American Revolution, and the British would then surrender within the year, granting America its independence at long last. This was Grim Battaglia. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. You have no idea how much it helps this channel to grow. For those of you who enjoy the revolution, have no fear. We will be back with more battles and documentaries covering the period, including the Battle of Mon Monmouth, and a video giving a sort of epilogue to this series, talking about why the British lost 
and what happened to all the loyalists who had resided in the colonies. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and please, never stop learning.